Um, I'll introduce Philip. Philip Nariffi is the Vice President of Species Protection at AWF. He's worked with AWF for more than 20 years and oversees the species program and inputs to AWS integrated conservation strategies that take into account landscape level approaches, social issues, and economic issues. Um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit today about the kind of state of the rhinoceros in Africa as it stands and what AWF has done um, over many years uh, to improve its status. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, what I would like to do um, <clears throat> Just now is to give you an overview of rhino status and uh, the status of conservation, and then be a bit provocative in terms of looking at what should be done and uh, is there a future for this. The film we've just seen is really representative of the real issues. Um, so Africa has two existing species of rhino: the white and black rhino. Um, <coughs> the white is the more numerous, as we shall see later. There are about six distinct subspecies uh, of these two species uh, of rhino. Now, where the rhino are is very important. There are about 25,000 rhino left in the world today. And uh, these two maps show broader historical range. Uh, and rhinos are remaining only in a few countries. In fact, as you will see later, or just now, there are about four big range states for rhino. So you have few animals concentrated in a few areas, and even in those few areas, as you shall see later, they are spread within very small populations. And that brings in issues of uh, uh, managing an endangered species that is, has populations that are fragmented. So it brings issues of biological management, uh, and that's put that uh, onto that, the pressure on, by, brought in by poaching, and you see what the species is really facing. So there is South Africa, which holds more than 80% of the rhinos in Africa today, the Republic of South Africa, Namibia, Kenya, and, uh, and, and Zimbabwe. And together, those countries hold about 99% of, of the rhino populations. There's another few countries, uh, which makes about 11 countries are the range states for, for rhino. If you look by management and land ownership, a lot of the rhinos are owned, are managed are on state lands. But there is a very important component of rhino ownership on, and management, which is the private sector. The private, then followed by, by you know, communal. The role of communities is very important as people who, as we look at where rhinos can, uh, we can expand. There are some rhinos on, on uh, military land and also on municipal land. This map, the intention for this map, I put it here just to say, in Kenya, just to illustrate the point about uh, the meta population management, how important it is, and uh, how fragmented the populations are. We have about 1,300 rhino in Kenya, of which about 700 are eastern black rhino. The rest are southern white, out of range. But these are spread in 18 conservation areas. They fall into what we call a, a rhino conservation area, such as the larger Savo. Uh, it could be in an intensive protection zone. Uh, this is an area where rhinos roam without the confines of a fence and where the levels of uh, deployment of rangers is quite high relative to the rest of the park. Then you have uh, rhino sanctuaries or rhino conservancies, and uh, you have captive bred rhino. So these are all different ways of managing rhino. What ails the rhino, as we'll hear from the other panelists? Mostly, as we saw in the film, the rhino is a single <laughs> source of threat, which is poaching. And that is important because what it does, it also means that um, not everybody can take care of rhino. Even where you have adequate uh, habitat, because of the cost of taking or of, of managing rhino, because of the high security you have to offer, not everybody 
is able to take care of Ryan. And in fact, in some cases, we have had people work very hard. Like in Kenya, two sanctuaries in the last two years gave up Rhino because they returned them to the Kenya Wildlife Service because it became too, too expensive. Uh, inadequate knowledge about the biological management you need to do. So we said fragmented populations. Uh, this fragmented and small populations, which sometimes requires that you move animals. If you do not understand those animals, you get issues of uh, breeding, you get into issues of capacity, uh, um, uh, current capacity issues. The incompatible trade, as we shall see later, uh, and they, it's expensive to manage rhinos. Uh, inadequate legislation in some countries, people who hold, uh, who are caught with the rhino horn, are get a fat on their back. And they, basically, there are some, as you'll see in those maps that I just showed you, there are many range states which could be who, where rhinos went extinct, but they are not making any efforts to recover those populations. Well, we've talked about rhino. Uh, and the poaching, and it's good to always reflect back. What is it that we really want for this species across, across, across its range? We want viable populations that are functional in their historic uh, range in Africa. We talked about those numbers, and I must say, historically, those numbers they are a very small proportion of what existed. There is some progress made. I don't want to paint a very bleak picture. Towards the end of that graph, you will see that. Uh, the number, this graph shows the number of rhino killed each year in South Africa, and there was a marginal improvement with, uh, from uh, 2015 to 2017. So it can be done, and progress is being made, but it's urgent, the species is conservation dependent. If we do nothing, it will not exist. And, and people like Ed will tell you that from real practice on the ground. The same thing, there's progress being made in other ranges. There are four countries that I mentioned, but they are not at this not at the level that we would like. Uh, we are reaching a stage where uh, we might be getting to no, a point of no return. But I want to point out to the white rhino, where at, in, around 1964, there was about 3,600, and now there are about 20,000. So there is hope. Conservation works, but the efforts must be concerted, must, be, must keep up. There is a need for in order to reverse this trend, I do believe sincerely that there is need to have political support at the highest level. I would like to go to the president of Uganda, for example, which was an important range state for, for the Eastern Black Rhino, and say to him, sir, why don't you have rhino? I would like to go to a place like Cameroon, which where the last uh, rhino was killed in 2012, and say to the president of Cameroon, your rhino just went extinct. What are you doing about it? Because this has to be something that comes from the Africans. And I believe that in some countries, like uh, it happens in Kenya or South Africa and other places, when the government says there will be no poaching, there will be no poaching. And so this high-level political support is very, very important. And that is some of the things that we are working on. The Wildlife Foundation is even as we do projects on the ground, we really want to have the political support because we think you go a long mile by uh, working at the various levels. But that is an area where we haven't really been concentrating. I also believe that uh, it is important for us to have, uh, to recover rhino, to have not only the range state uh, action and recovery plans for those species, but also to have continental wide. And there is a draft uh, uh, Africa wide uh, rhino recovery plan, rhino recovery and action plan because it will take more than just one country. It will take more than one just country, for example, to work on the Eastern Black Rhino to recover those populations. In Kenya, where we have the most of the animals, uh, the largest population, we are running out of space, and we have to start looking at other countries like Uganda. Just for those who, of you who like rhino so much, when you do your action plans, always remember that rhino do not exist in isolation. The integration of rhino programs into other programs within a park is so, so important. I have seen uh, negative feedback when we argue for rhino so much, and the, we other programs come in and say, no, the rhino is getting too much attention, and you don't want to do that. Um, we, we convened a summit in Nairobi in 2012 at African Wildlife Foundation, and we brought up the range states and the experts. 
where we basically produced uh, some sort of actions that needed to be done. And uh, this, I put this photo here just to illustrate that in order to do that political, high level political support for this species, we have the enough knowledge. We cannot say, we cannot let this species go extinct because we don't have enough information. We have information enough for us to act. And uh, that information needs to feed up, feed up to the ground, and but also feed up to, uh, to the political level. Conserving rhinos requires specialized capacity. We have talked about biological management, so we need training that is very targeted and equipping, training and equipping that is very, very targeted. For example, in order to do metapopulation management or even to manage them in a sanctuary, you need to know your population well. You need to know the carrying capacity. If the carrying capacity exceeds before you see any death, you start to see reduction in reproductive rates and survivorship. And that is equivalent to poaching. So just keeping your rhinos, like it happens in some countries uh, or in some sites where they don't want to exchange and they don't want to do metapopulation management, effectively what you are doing is you are doing poaching. So collaboration is very important, it's very specialized. Uh, looking at collecting data, checking the records, interpreting that information into management actions. Uh, just uh, some of the equipment that we recently given to Kenya Wildlife Service, a uh, scene of crime. Joining, uh, working in a more disciplinary manner, bringing in other agencies. We cannot leave, one of the lessons we have learned is that you cannot have successful rhino conservation by just leaving this work to the wildlife authority. They don't have the capacity. They need intelligence, they need police, and they need to work with customs. They need to, you need to connect this work to anti-trafficking work. Uh, and also we stop the demand work. It takes knowing the behavior of the animal in order for you to really understand where to see it. You know, people, rhino practitioners have some rules about when you declare an animal not present in your population and you need to know how to look for them. I spent some time tracking with rangers in a Savongulia rhino sanctuary a whole day but we did not see any animal you could see all the footprints. I believe them that the animals were there. <laughs> <laughs> Habitat management is very, very important. When you, so rhino sanctuaries were started to basically grow the populations with the aim of releasing rhinos back to the wild. So when you, like here in Ngulia, in, this is in southwest, they started with a small sanctuary about 10 square kilometers, they went up to 63, then they went up to, to about 100. So putting rhinos in a sanctuary is not an end to itself. When the population grows, what is your plan? So here our plan, so the rest of the surrounding is Savo National Park. And the, our plan here was that if they grew, we would open up the fence. But then the poaching crisis continued. And we could not make, I say we, I'm a member of the National Rhino Management Committee in Kenya. So the decision that we made was when we reached here, we had to remove some of the the, the competing browsers, like uh, giraffe, like elephants, so that we could release that uh, carrying capacity. We then extended the fence to get more, more space, and you can see immediately the rhino population growing. Now we are at a stage again where we need to take action. We need to expand that sanctuary or bring down the fence, and the debate continues. But rhino, this is a very good example of, a, of, of the fact that conservation works. This population now, this site is a source population, which means we are taking rhinos out of Mongolia and they're taking them to other sites, therefore meeting the very uh, reason why sanctuaries were started. We send in people to evaluate the place. We send in people to evaluate uh, today's Rob. Uh, perhaps some of you will know him. We send them to, if you are taking rhinos to a new place, it's actually very technical also. You need to look at uh, the place, does it security, but does it also have food, does it have water? All those issues are, are, are taken into consideration. So it's a specialized area. Just another example here, I'm sorry for the, for, for the uh, model thing up there. This is an expansion we are doing at the uh, Olpegeta, which is another population. We have about 120 uh, rhinos. We are expanding that, uh, 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 that fence to, to the land uh, on to the ranch known as Muchara, AWF is supporting them to build a fence which is 40 uh, 
uh, kilometer, that will release the carrying capacity and uh, move that population to about uh, 175. Um, and uh, just going back to my point about putting Rhino in the bigger context, by doing that, we are also going to be creating a corridor for other wildlife. And that project then becomes more important, not just in terms of Rhino. Stopping the trafficking is very, very important. I can see our colleagues from IML here. We are uh, working together. Uh, these dogs that we've placed in several uh, airports and countries in, in, in Africa, Kenya, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, Botswana, Cameroon, are very important. The dogs are trained in many scents, and one of those scents, smells, is, is rhino. Uh, they're working as a deterrent. Uh, we're working at, to educate people. We are also working to make sure that people face the law. It's a scalable solution. As you can see, those are the areas where we are putting these dogs. <clears throat> and then most important, training of prosecutors, the investigators, prosecutors, judges, to make sure that uh, once somebody is held, they can face the law. We don't want to jail people. We want them to, we want to do justice for people and justice for biodiversity, justice for the virus. Now, coming back to a common voice, this is just an illustration that uh, Africa goes to CITES, for example, the Convention on, uh, uh, on Trade in Endangered Species, and never goes in a single voice. And so decisions that are made by Africa, for Africa, the art CITES, are made by non registered states. So one of the things that we would like to do continuously and uh, aggressively is to get a common African voice. So there will be a proposal, for example, proposal number eight, that will be brought to the 18th meeting of the Conference of Parties for CITES, is really about trade. Uh, I'm not saying that trade is bad. You may have your own view of that. But what I'm saying is, has Africa discussed such a proposal? Has, can Africa go together? There are about there are 183 range states, uh, I mean, signatory, signatories to CITES. If, and we said there are 11 countries big that have uh, rhino, if the African countries go to CITES without a common voice, the decision will be made for them by the rest 177 countries that have, are at CITES. So the demand is very important. So we have programs in Vietnam, we have programs in uh, China, having the dialogue with Chinese, telling them, welcome to Africa, help us do the, the, the development, stay away from our heritage. <laughs> and it works pretty well, because our view is, let us dialogue about it. We are not saying you are bad guys, but please know that this is, is not replaceable. Sometimes, you know, uh, we've got a strategic partnership such as this one here we have with the British and we are using this to reach uh, more than 8 million people who visit the zoo each year. And uh, let me end there and say securing rhino is really securing biodiversity. And most importantly, this is a mega species, it's a keystone species. So securing this species is really about securing human well-being. And the way I will know that I am really succeeding is not by just looking at the rhino and going back to the goal about rhino, but we'll be cheating ourselves if we only do that and we don't achieve some economic gains. But that's what people are looking at. That's concerning right many money. Also, can we support land? But always remember about saving species and saving our own human well-being. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Ed. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a short introduction. <laughs> okay, so Ed Thayer is Zambia Country Director for Frankfurt Zoological Society and also manages the North Lunga Conservation Program. He's based uh, in the park, in Okolonga National Park, where the project provides technical assistance across the broader ecosystem, ranging from the implementation of training needs, setup of management systems, and facilitation of all aspects of operations. So, big job, and we're Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, and I think that's a very useful overview from Philip um, going over the kind of the, the broader, the bigger picture. So I'll just drill down basically on a kind of a site level perspective. Um, um, and this is one of our rhinos in, in North Wagra. So we uh, basically started a small rhino reintroduction program um, in, in North Wagra, and I'll show you where. Um, this is part of another presentation, so I shall stick to the rhino sections. But so North Wagra is here in kind of northeastern Zambia. Um, the park is about 4,500 square k's. The wider area that we operate over is 22,000 square kilometers, but the rhino sanctuary sort of, um, referred to within that is 1,200 square k's, but in the core of the park. Um, and we, oh, I've lost some of my formatting. Okay, we support basically, I'm going to run through the nuts and bolts because this is really what makes it tick for us is um, focusing on just the basics um, to make the, the, the functionality of the protected area management strategy, should we say, um, work. So that's just um, starting with the scout, starting with the men on the ground, men and women these days on the ground. Um, so we do a huge amount of in-service training and high-level training um, for the scouts, um, trying to do it as regular as possible to maintain standards, maintain discipline, maintain motivation, um, and also upskill with new technology or upskill with new concepts as they come online. Um, we try and retrain everybody approximately four times a year um, and then make sure kit and equipment is replaced and functional the whole time um, and able to kind of provide scouts with the confidence to know they've got the kit that they need to do their job. Um, that's a big factor often you'll find scouts that don't actually have the kit that they need for the job you're asking them to do. So um, that's a, a big part of our work. We've also now, these days we use DAS, or what is now called Earth Ranger, so we're able now to um, manage live time, live tracking of our patrols, all these little green radios, symbols and blue ones there, radios, they're patrol radios or, um, or vehicles, um, and you're able now to have, see them on a, on, a, on a live context. We have, you can see some elephants there, with all of our GPS track wildlife, um, um, satellite track wildlife appears on here. Planes appear on here, undercover vehicles appear on here, um, and soon about one, one rhino appears on here. This is an old shot. We just started a new program with um, another company. I think I'll pitch it also here with Sigfox, yeah. um, which is just starting to, to get online now, which means that we can manage our scout patrols and our other logistics um, um, up to in current time as opposed to having to react. And, 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 and deal with things later on, um, which is proving a bit of a, a, quite a game changer. For example, I can log onto this here, and I can speak to people, I can get on WhatsApp, and I can speak to our, uh, our teams on the ground and quickly see what's going on. Um, equally, it is a kind of internal policing because people now know that they can be seen, they know where they are. We've used it, unfortunately, on two or three internal policing issues, uh, but that's a reality. I mean, I think from the film, we can see that's a reality. Um, Anyway, so that's a quick overview of, of this. So in 2001, we embarked upon our rhino reintroduction program. As mentioned, Zambia really, um, Zambia's rhinos were poached to zero. Um, and so we, uh, at the time, it was the single largest reintroduction into a former range state. I think that's been superseded now probably by Botswana. Um, but um, so we started off, we brought in 25 unrelated animals over a longer period of time than we wanted to, but when you come to negotiating with various different governments, things take a lot longer than you realize. So 25 animals over seven years, was meant to be over two years, uh, but over seven years. They all came in from South Africa, um, and they all came in on C-130s Hercules into our little airstrip inside North Wangle National Park. Um, and, um, and then we reintroduced them, we used sanctuaries, as uh, Philip referenced from Gulia, and in fact we used a lot of the lessons learned from Gulia for a lot of our work, actually, um, including the team, um, I think the, the same guy we saw in the picture, Rob Brett, came and helped us with some of the setup and some of the design. Um, and to date, that population has, has done, has, it, we had some adaptation challenges, and I'm happy to feel some questions on that later on. Initially, these day, um, since then, since that adaptation phase, don't forget these animals came from South Africa, North Wangra is very different. It's like us if we go somewhere completely different. It takes a while to get to know where you're going to get water, where you're going to eat, what you're going to eat, um, and the social fabric of their of their or the social their social structure is, is was quite, I think has been quite misunderstood or or, or um, not not understood fully. 
Um, and we've seen now that, that, that once you get over that, once they're, once they're in, and if you translocate cohorts, you're going to be able to have a much quicker success. So we are doing, and now we've got one of the fastest growth rates um, on the continent, um, and we are just now a key two population. So it's all going um, well at the moment, but it takes a huge amount of effort. Um, and this is fencing. So just like Philip said, we started off with the fencing. We had a small area, then we got bigger as we got more animals in. Then we got up to about 300 square k's. And the whole plan was to take down the fence and let the rhinos roam across North Rangwa. And bang, that same rhino poaching hit in uh, 2010, I think it was. And suddenly we had to jump around and find some more funding and put the fence back up again. Um, um, which was a great shame because we also then had to expand. It we went from 300 square k's up to 1,200 square k's. Um, so we, kind of, we thought it was this kind of step backwards, but I think in reality that's probably here to stay. I think, don't think the threats and the pressures are going to reduce, and so I think we'll have to get used to it. Our sanctuary fence basically just stops rhinos moving out. It means that they're contained within an area that we can focus on. Everything else, elephants go over, um, lions under, impalas over, um, hippos through it, buffaloes through it. Um, <laughs> and some rhinos, youngsters especially, sub are looking for their own territories. They will go through, but they generally come back and we, we have another program here. So we, we track all of our rhinos, just um, as, as we heard from Philip. So we try and see every rhino at least twice a month. We try and monitor their body condition. We try to monitor who they're socializing with. We try and see um, what areas they're using so that I can better guide our law enforcement efforts. But equally, you certainly with your, um, uh, when you're managing the population like this, you've got to be able to keep an eye on their conditions, see what's going on. Uh, but by doing this, we cover the ground. So it's 1,200 square k's. It means that pretty much every square inch of that area is covered on foot. So yes, we're going after runners and trying to see them and trying to work at the condition, but equally that's our biggest um, uh, or one of our one of our main security or law enforcement efforts. The fence outside the 1200 square case, every single meter is walked every day uh, by officers checking for anything coming in, anything going out, and then obviously beyond that we do a wider kind of law enforcement um, effort. Here we're putting in VHF transmitters. Is this thing? Oh, right. VHF transmitter actually in here and a um, six box unit in the front there, um, and we. Immobilize the rhino and um, drill the holes in, put the transmitters in, fill it up with an epoxy, and then reverse the animal. We don't do cows anymore. They're too important. They're too um, too valuable, and the risk of any loss of calf or, or loss of cow is, is too high. And they're, they're generally not going anywhere. They're quite well behaved. Um, it's some of the younger boys or big boys that move around, or some of the young females who are looking to get away um, um, from certain areas. Uh, last end of last year, so we were we were as I said, Zambia lost all of its rhinos. Um, so the closest living relatives were Zimbabwe rhinos, the Zambezi Valley rhinos, um, and there were two males available in uh, Victoria Falls. So at the end of last year, we managed to after after a short two year negotiation, managed to get two of them um, exported on a truck. And have anybody been to uh, Victoria Falls? You'll remember the falls are here and the bungee jump on the right here. Um, and we, after a pretty grueling 36 hour journey, got them up to North Rangwa. So we have two males now from the Zambezi who will hopefully um, put their genes into our population. Um, but that was, yeah, that we completed that at the end of last year. And again, part of the meta population, meta management population. Um, dogs, yep. As, as Philip alluded to, we also use these a lot. These have, these have become an integral part of our, of our effort. We've got four dogs now, actually all from here, from Montana. Um, detection dogs that are trained on four, on, on nine cents. Um, and they have made our whole operation extremely efficient um, when it comes to dealing with the communities and dealing, well, dealing with problems in the community or in the in towns because they enable us to get in and out really quickly. We previously would have taken many um, hours to search buildings, search areas. The dog, dogs may even get in, out, get in and out quickly. Um, and it also has provided a great opportunity. We now have um, uh, just under 50% of our handlers are now, are now female handlers, which is great. So we've got to open up opportunities for, for women to get into the, the law enforcement work within Zambia. 
2012, when we saw the rhino poaching and the elephant poaching kicking off, we invested quite heavily um, in a well, revitalization of the intelligence investigations unit. It started off um, with the four guys basically on the right and one small unit in our local town. Um, and then we expanded that to it's now 12 units across the whole northeastern section of Zambia with 32 um, uh, men and women. Now, and that's been a really big impact. We've managed to knock out quite a lot of traders, um, lower level, lower to middle level traders in the border towns between Tanzania and Zambia, Zambia and Malawi, um, and um, in the kind of major kind of urban areas. And that's, I mean, it's been a big investment, but it's made a huge amount of difference. Um, God. Again, these are our major nut, nuts and bolts. This is the, the workshop. Um, nearly 50% nearly of our budget is spent on vehicles, spares, fuel, um, and, and on workshop support, um, which is 22,000 square kilometers our operational area. Um, so we've got a fleet of 50 with 33 land cruisers, Hiluxes, Prados, trucks, tractors. It's, it's the biggest section and biggest headache of our operation. And we're, we're lucky we've got um, quite a few young Zambians coming through now, taking on bigger roles. We've got um, good dialogue with the Commonwealth University. It's creating really good um, 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 students to come out of there. And with all this rhino work and the protection work we're doing, there's a lot more opportunity for, for higher level jobs. Um, infrastructure. So we do quite a lot. This is something. Um, that made a big difference to us in our protection work is ensuring we've got better access around our intensive protection zone, around the Rhino Sanctuary, but also other parts of the park. So we've built, I think that's about 38 of these bridges. Uh, that means, because often these are just the barrier that gets stops you from going another 10K, so a deployment or an extraction or to make an arrest. So putting these in, and these don't cost that much. I mean, you can generally get these in between you know, five and fifteen thousand dollars, and you suddenly got access, uh, and they're there forever. So we put in a lot of put a lot of effort to put these in place. That's the same. Bridge. It also means scouts and their families can get in and can get out. So that looking after the families is a key thing. Just realise I think some of these slides are in a funny order. Anyway, um, something else we focused on is scouts families. So we've built, um, tried to build permanent houses for all scouts, uh, so they can all have um, you know uh, tin roofs and and concrete um, buildings for them and their families. So when they're out on patrol, they know their families are in somewhere safe. We've got 75 houses here, and in total, we've done 190 houses across the ecosystem. And in fact, we're about to do some more. Um, and then we focused on this up here is a school and dormitory block. So we built a school for the scouts and their children, and built dormitories so that those um, scouts who are in further afield places can send their kids to a school that is part of the same system, not completely um, somewhere else. Conservation Education Program. Um, so we now focus on 22 schools around the ecosystem. We deliver a course within their normal curriculum, um, which is focused on conservation, not just Rhino, but conservation messages in general. And we now bring in those schools uh, once a year. They come into the park. They get three nights in the park. They go on a game drive. They get a tour of the workshop of the ops room um, and uh, a talk from the scouts. Um, and they get to see what else there is to do with, within conservation, within wildlife, what the other opportunities are for jobs. And we've got quite a few now that have come through as employees or scouts, um, which is nice to see. It's kind of coming full circle. So yeah, with all of that effort, and it's, I mean, I make it sound quite simple, um, but it's, we, are, we are one of the only areas that got a zero poach rhino status to date, um, and long may that last. Um, but yeah, it's quite, a, quite a huge amount of effort from a number of partners. Um, also, there were approach elephants from last year, but quickly some of these. This is unfortunately there's a big thing up here that says um, communities, because I think that's <laughs> pretty much akin to what Philip was saying. That's our biggest challenge right now. So law enforcement, we haven't got it sorted. That's always going to be um, a massive challenge. But if we don't address the ownership and the participation of communities and the adjoining communities in these areas, if we don't address um, the inequality there and ensure that they have ownership of the land, but equally of the decision making of what goes on, then I think everything we do is futile. Um, and we have embarked now on a, we now about three or four years into a program of trying to change uh, government policy 
was funded by a lobby for a change of government policy to decentralize decision making for the communities to own um, the concessions that they, where they live in their own land um, and to be able to engage in their own transactions for um, leases with investors in those areas and then most importantly to retain that revenue because if they don't retain that revenue then what's the point? At the moment, we're teaching people and advising people to, to protect their wildlife because of the revenue that you should get, as opposed to being able to educate them about the revenue they should, that, 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 that they are getting. So that's a big, it's a big challenge. Uh, we are making progress. We last year we set up a CBNRM national um, forum, and they managed to get the parliament the parliamentary select committees looking at it, and a task force has been set up. So we're hoping for change, um, and it needs to come because I think otherwise these areas will, will simply disappear. I think that is mostly it on the main bit. Am I out of time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just one quick thing. There is another area in northern uh, Rwanda, and I just want to show you northern Zambia. This is a tiggy thicket. This used to be prime rhino habitat, um, and we are luckily getting to a stage where our population is going to reach its carrying capacity in north Rwanda. So we've embarked we're two years into this project. Hopefully, in about three to four years' time, we should be ready to take cohorts of animals into that area. And I should also say, because I think it's relevant from the film, but the rhinos, um, that's it, you can take it off me. Yep. Um, the <laughs> rhinos we brought up all came from South Africa. Had they not come from those areas where they came, those are the areas that have been most targeted, and actually, they would probably be dead. Uh, but they've come up now, and they've, they're, they're, they've created a new population in Zambia. So, this idea of collaboration and looking at former range states, looking to Uganda, talking to Cameroon, it is what should be done now because I think it'd be the more we can spread the risk and spread the eggs, um, the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Kathleen Fitzgerald. She leads the Conservation Capital Sustainable Ecosystems Africa Division. And she has 25, more than 25 years experience in integrated large landscape conservation programs in Africa and in North America. Uh, she was, uh, until recently, a senior staff member of AWF for about 11 years, uh, serving as vice president for East and Southern Africa portfolio. So we're happy to have Kathleen present on the Rhino Impact Bond. Great, today. Thanks. Thanks for having yeah. Um, thanks everyone for sticking around. It's been a long afternoon of rhinos. Um, so thanks for your interest and passion. And I think the sequencing, Rebecca, thank you for setting this up. Um, starting with community engagement, community empowerment, and really the need for that as a great challenge, which Ed has just highlighted. Um, Philip talking about the crisis and where we are in terms of the continental herd. What I want to focus on is one of the other significant challenges to rhino conservation in Africa, and that's money. How do we pay for it? And while it's been incredible that we've seen a lot of capital coming into Africa to support rhinos and other endangered species, it's short term. And so it limits on the ground managers like Ed at Frankfurt Zoological Society and others to actually grow rhino population. And so the Rhino Impact Bond is designed to bring in new capital to rhino conservation, but also to address this issue of short-term limited funding. Not a public offering, so for those of you interested in investing, this is not an offering to do so. This is just for informational purposes. So the vision with the Rhino Impact Bond, first of all, is to deliver better efficiency for funders. Those that are investing in conservation, donors, investors, we want to give them a more effective outcome. Um, long term, we want to ensure that protected areas are managed well, they're managed efficiently, and we want to shift the risk of conservation support, and I'll talk a little bit about this, from traditional donors to investors, and by investors, I mean people that are putting money in. They may lose their money. They may actually generate more revenue. But what we find with a lot of donors is that investing in Africa, it seems risky. And so how do we minimize that risk for donors who have not yet invested in Africa? And that's what we're trying to do with the bond. 
Um, and, and the Rhino Impact Bond is the first step in a long-term vision towards more efficient protected area management. So Philip gave us these statistics and we know them. We have rural conservationists in the room. So the bottom line is business as usual is not working. So we have to do something differently. The CBNRM program that Frankfurt just talked about, it's different, it's innovative, it's, it's new. That's the stuff that we need to be doing. Um, and so that's what's driving this rhino impact bond, is introducing a new mechanism to support rhinos. And the funders over the last two years that have been supporting the development of this bond um, are here, UNDP, GEF, United for Wildlife, the Royal Foundation. They've invested in the last two years to develop a, this bond um, and, and develop sites to be investment ready. So what are the challenges? The three challenges that the bond is trying to address is, is one, funding without success. So if you're a traditional donor and you're giving money, you may or may not succeed. That's just the nature of conservation. And, you know, as Philip pointed out with some of these sites, it's complicated, it's tricky, and sometimes we succeed. Um, the second thing is short funding cycles. You know, Ed joked about negotiating for two years to translocate rhinos. That's actually pretty quick for Africa. So we need long-term funding in order to actually grow rhinos. And then the third, third thing, again, the timeline in terms of the rhino development and growth. So these are the three things that we're trying to address. What's been happening in Africa, and Philip highlighted this really well, is that with the poaching crisis, we've been focusing on protect, protect, protect. And that's what we should be doing, and that's what we had to do. However, now we need to look at how do we actually grow the rhino population, and, and Ed's presentation really talked about that. How do you protect an area, bring in a new population, and enable that growth? And this here is a chart that is in Gulia Rhino Sanctuary, which Philip talked about. So currently, right now, there are approximately 105 rhinos in Angulia Rhino Sanctuary. Their growth rate is 1%, which is really low. The Kenyan growth rate, which is in the strategy that Philip highlighted, is 5%. So Kenya is saying, we want our population to grow at 5%. In order to do that, we need 76 to 87 rhinos in Angulia Rhino Sanctuary, between 4 and 6 percent. So that means moving rhinos. Kenyan Wildlife Service knows how to move rhinos. They've done it before. However, they don't have the resources. I know everyone's cringing at that <laughs> part, right? <laughs> They've done it many times before. We had one bad incident. And actually, what that incident has done is we now have new guidelines for translocation, which is going to improve how it's done in the future. Um, but yes, we had a bad incident. Um, now I've lost my track. On <laughs> <laughs> so in order to grow our population, the target is 5%. We need to move rhinos. And the reason why <laughs> it's not happening right now is because Kenyan Wildlife Service does not have the resources as, as Philip highlighted in Angulia, if you're going to move, let's say, 24 rhinos out of Angulia Rhino Sanctuary to increase your growth rate, it means translocation costs, it means protection in the IPZ, and they just don't have the resources to do So the idea of a rhino impact bond is how do we grow black rhinos and grow them quickly? And it's been a long process, which I'm happy to talk anyone through. The rhino, African Rhino Specialist Group started with 130 populations. And they looked at, first they looked at Asia and Africa. But essentially they said, if we're going to increase this critically endangered species, what are the best sites biologically where we can do this? So they narrowed it down to 34. And again, 25 were in Africa, 9 in Asia. 
They then took another lens and said, okay, with a rhino impact bond, which is a five year period to grow rhino, which sites can actually support this growth? I.e., if you're gonna bring in an influx of capital, which sites are actually going to be able to deliver? And it came down to five. And those five are here. So Philip highlighted Olpegida Conservancy. It's a private conservancy in Lycipia, Lewa Barana Conservancy, and Savo West National Park. So there are two private conservancies, one public site. In South Africa, we have the Addo Elephant National Park, which is managed by Sand Parks and Great Fish Nature Reserve, which is a provincial reserve. These five sites represent 12% of the continental population of black rhino in Africa. The next thing that was done is a very detailed theory of change at each site level. And the first thing was, well, what theory of change are we going to use to do that? A theory of change was developed by the Rhino Impact Bond team. It's been published. It was published two weeks ago, so I'm happy to share that with anyone interested. And again, this is not a bunch of um, people sitting in a room in Nairobi. This is with the Rhino Specialist Group, IUCN, Sam Parks, KWS, partners on the ground. It's been a very um, long and detailed process. So with the theory of change, the question is, if you're going to increase your population over a five-year period, what do you need to do? What are the key threats? What are the barriers? And how do you grow that population? These are the five things that we looked at, habitat management, range availability, anti-poaching, population management, enabling conditions, all things that Ed and Philip highlighted in their presentations. Each site now has a five-year detailed plan. I'm talking extremely detailed in terms of rhino growth. Everything from binoculars to trucks to move rhinos to rangers on the ground to radios, everything. Vet, all the vets were there, for example, from KWS to look at if you're going to translocate rhinos, what's the medicine you need, and how many years in advance do you need to start planning for that. Very detailed. What came out of that? Five sites are in the top, and on the left are the different categories or budgets for each site. This is an indicative budget of 40 million US dollars over five years for five sites, which actually is not that much when you think about what it takes to protect and to expand a population. These budgets are now being reviewed by an independent committee of rhino specialists who actually know how much it costs to do this, but it's roughly $40 million. And again, these are the sites at the top with the existing number of rhinos. These are the budgets. And then each site has a growth target. So for example, in South Africa, their growth rates are higher than in Kenya. All the sites in Kenya are much lower. All of them are less than 1%. Um, so there's this protect, protect, protect happening in Kenya. All of these are weighted and furled up into a target growth rate, which is 5.6% for the five sites. It's a portfolio growth target. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna whip through. One of the key things that is part of the theory of change is what happens at the end of five years. And in a lot of these sites, what we found is they're not optimizing commercial opportunities in those sites. So for example, Great Fish, which Philip knows very well, incredible landscape, easy access, right on a paved road, beautiful scenery, they don't have tourism. So we're not suggesting that we can make them financially sustainable, but what we are suggesting is over the next five years of business planning and tourism planning, we will decrease the gap in funding. It's a key component to this. Social inclusion is a key component to that theory of change. So there's a whole section in the theory of change about how to engage, empower, um, and improve the lives of communities living with the rhinos. So where, where does the bond and where does the bond come in? Here's the idea is that 
here are the five sites. We have growth targets and we have financial targets. The idea is to have investors who are currently not investing in conservation finance the bond. So it's a 40 million bond. And so Ed is an investor and he's going to invest $40 million in the bond. His money is going to be used to implement a five year strategy. They're actually going to do the work using Ed's money. And then at the end, although every year there is an evaluation, at the end of the five years, if we achieve our targets, Ed will get his money back. If we go above our targets, he's actually going to maybe make 2% <coughs> on his investment. So then the question is, okay, but if you spent the money and Ed's getting his money back, where does the actual money come from? And the money comes from the outcome payers. So these are the institutions or individuals who will agree to pay back the investor. The question is, well, why would they do that? The reason they would do that is they're only paying if we succeed. It goes back to donors right now are currently paying whether we succeed or whether we fail. Now they're only going to pay if we succeed. And the other thing is oftentimes donors are paying and they're evaluating inputs. So they're looking at how many boots did you buy, how many kilometers did you cover. Now they are paying for outcomes and the outcome goes back to the growth. How many rhinos did you grow? And if you grow 5.6 and meet your target, you get your money back plus interest. So that's how the bond is structured and that's how it works. And the idea is these investors currently, they're not engaging in conservation because there isn't a platform for which they can engage. So ideally, we're bringing in new donors. Many investors have already said they would take that capital and put it into the next bond, which is great. And then longer term, what we would love to see is that folks like us in this room could invest. And rather than investing in the stock market tied to oil or something, we're actually looking on the computer and we're watching the number of rhinos going up and down and our return will be based on conservation outcomes. It's obviously very long term, but we need to start here and this is the first. And so the idea is to prove the concept with rhino, which are big gray and relatively easy to measure. I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. Um, but that's obviously because they're critically endangered and because we needed to start with a particular species, rhinos were selected. So I'm going to stop there because I think I'm out of time. I do have more details in terms of income and percent return, et cetera. Um, but we'll have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I've got just a couple of questions, and I know there are probably some burning questions in the room, um, and even those of you that we have listening in. So, um, communities has come up a lot, and that's obviously a theme from the film. So, um, I wanted to ask each of you just to speak a little bit more about your efforts to engage communities in the conservation strategies that you've presented, um, seeing as the support of communities living in or adjacent to the areas can really uh, make or break um, outcomes and greatly influence the success of retina conservation measures. Um, so maybe we'll start with Philip and work on down the line. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the issue of uh, communities really, to me, brings this thought about whose rhinos are they. In the film, you see that come out. And uh, to, we say it's uh, Africa's heritage, but you could see in the film that there was tension between the brother and the brother-in-law. You know, are you, is this a white man's rhino? And I think this is where it is so important to really realize the contribution of the, the communities. We bring in communities as a owners of land and habitat, and therefore they are key stakeholders. They, they, they therefore need to not only realize that, but be active players. Uh, they are in the front of uh, They know who is coming onto their land, so they, they are very much a part of the anti-poaching uh, 
uh, process, but most importantly, if well nurtured and well uh, involved, communities gain uh, can gain from conservation. Uh, we need to put wildlife conservation as a comp uh, to compete with other types of land uses. There's progress made in this. Uh, in Kenya, for example, there are a few community rhino uh, uh, conservancies that are operating. So it's part of the future, as I said, uh, we are running out of space for rhinos. A lot of this space is going to be in community areas. And so the involving them is very important for the species, but also for the people. <clears throat> I think Philip's pretty much covered it all there. Um, but yeah, I think that's spot on. I think we, certainly for us in, in, a, in a Zambian context, it's we're a bit behind, I think, the, we're a bit behind continental policy in some respects. And I think we need to address it very quickly. We're going to lose vast tracts of land that are um, the buffer areas for the national parks if we don't address it quickly, if we don't put ownership of the resource and the land in the community's name. And as I said, I think when I was talking, the ownership of the decision making, that's key um, as well. So I think um, certainly our biggest challenge is actually changing policy and changing the way it's perceived by the decision makers um, within government at the moment. Um, but we're, we're pushing along, but it has to change, otherwise I think we, we, we will really struggle. Yeah, I'm, the only other comment I would make um, relates back to business as usual just is not working. And, and I am still surprised when I hear people speaking about community benefits and they're talking about token benefits that don't change the lives of communities. Um, and it will not work and it starts with that decentralizing of it being able to engage in wildlife management, being able to engage with private sector, which in many countries, communities are still not empowered to do that. Um, and so I think the process that is happening in Zambia needs to be replicated elsewhere just so that they can do that. Because in some countries, it's, it's not possible. Um, Kenya is a great example where communities can actively engage with private sector directly. They don't have to have money going to central government and then back down. We all know what happens. Um, so I think critical shifts like that need to happen. Um, from in the landscapes that you work, what are the um, biggest causes of human wildlife conflict? Uh, and can you speak a little bit about um, what those are and, and how you're addressing them? Start. We'll come back to Start this. Back okay. This <laughs> I mean, one of the key things around human wildlife conflict is. Um, in most countries, not a surprise, Africa's changing, it's changing fast. And so we're seeing development take place in areas that um, are currently being utilized by wildlife. And so one of the first things that many conservation organizations like AWF are doing um, is land use planning, because spatially planning is critical. And you can have really good conservation next to really good farming, for example, as long as it's planned appropriately. So what's happening right now with growth in Africa is that it's happening at such a fast pace. We're seeing roads going into areas that are habitat um, and it just creates conflict. So starting with proper land use planning, which enables separation to the extent possible of wildlife and farming and settlement is critical. And then utilizing different techniques um, to mitigate human wildlife conflict, like fencing. We saw some fencing. Um, and it's very controversial in many places, but in some cases, fencing is needed. Um, and there's a lot of creative stuff taking place around beehive fencing and chili fencing. Um, which is great because it's providing commercial opportunities as well as separating and mitigating that human wildlife conflict. Yeah, I think again, Kathleen has pretty much covered most of it. I think that's um, that's spot on. And obviously, when you do get increases um, in in wildlife populations, you, that exacerbates that that conflict. Um, I think one point to add, maybe to some of those tools of the land use planning, is key. I completely agree with that. But then, equally, the, the value for your planning has to be realised. Uh, so, the, if you plan to demarcate this area for 
wildlife in this area for farming and you're farming, you're able to retain the revenue from your farming, be that in, in food for your family or income, um, and you set aside this land for wildlife and yet you don't retain the revenue, then what's the point? Just make it all farming. So that's obviously a key component, but that's the same as the previous um, answer. But we've also focused recently on um, grain stores. So it's not just a human wildlife conf the conflict um, during the, the growing season, but then because a lot of people will grow their maize in the rainy season, um, especially maize is a staple, a staple diet in, 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 in much of Africa um, or southern Africa. Um, and if you, um, grains have previously been stored um, in weak structures, in, in kind of wicker structures. So of late, we started building concrete grain stores so that people, you don't lose your entire harvest, which is basically your food for the entire year until the next rainy season. Um, so if you can protect that at least, you know, you might lose, unfortunately, you might lose bits of your field during the growing season, but if it's harvested on time, um, and if you can get it stored um, safely in a, in, a, in a concrete grain store, then you've got a chance at least you can preserve your, your, your food for the family for the year. So that's one tool that we're using. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> just to add on that, uh, the issue of uh, that some of these solutions that to human wildlife conflict don't necessarily need to be very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, we are, the, the importance of human wildlife conflict really depends on the species you're talking about. So for large carnivores, for example, lions, it's much more important than a, <clears throat> than a rhino. Because rhinos are in sanctuaries and fenced in, you don't see much human wildlife conflict. But uh, for carnivores particularly, uh, in the Amboseli area when we worked there, we realized that a lot of the solutions lay with human behavior. So cattle and, uh, and, and shorts, goats and sheep were, that were attacked by lions or hyena were primarily those that were left without a herdsman. And at night, those who are left roaming outside. So a change in behavior, a change in herding practices, really uh, building a lion proof uh, crowds or bombers solved your problem. So it's really a matter of human behavior. Um, also, human wildlife conflict can be escalated simply by the leaders. So mm -hmm. by local leaders, as sending the wrong message to, to local people, escalating that and setting the wrong uh, expectations. So we need to get leaders on our side, but we also we need to make sure that for those land use plans to work, we need to have incentives. So in the Savo area, for example, we are working on a, a, a community conservancy called LUMO, where we have a lodge, and therefore with that we are able to offset uh, the cost of living with wildlife. Yeah. Um, so last question for me. Um, in the film, we see that one of the main characters is a ranger um, and kind of provides that front line and being poachers face on. Um, and so from your perspective, I'm wondering what is the role of law enforcement um, in stemming the poaching crisis? I'm gonna start with yeah, this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saved the hard one. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, okay, um, I'll try and answer the question by maybe answering something else. So the, uh, the film is very good. I mean, that's a very realistic scenario. That is exactly what happened. Um, and we've got very, uh, quite a number of incidents like that. And it's all about, you know, ensuring that the wider community obviously are buy in to the, to the reason, to the value, to the, to the benefits. Um, but equally, it's also about the motivation, I think, of, um, of your team. The stay on the ground. Um, so, so to your question again, how does law enforcement tackle the, the social challenge? In sending the poaching crisis. What sending the poaching crisis. Well, it's only yeah. part, the law yeah. enforcement is only part of the, uh, of the tools that we mm -hmm. have to tackle it. I mean, it, law enforcement on its own is not going to do it. Um, I think that's very clear. It has to be um, a combination. And I think we, you know, we, it's coming out here very clearly. It's got to be local devolved ownership and decision making, and it has to be good law enforcement at the same time, it has to be meta uh, population management, and it has to be you know, government supported. I mean, so I think, I think, I guess the take home really is don't focus on one thing, you've got to focus on, focus on everything, on all yeah. these aspects. Yeah, okay. Now I think that answers. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No, no, law enforcement has its place. Yeah. It's, it's got to be done with a, in a very socially acceptable manner. Right, uh, so with that, I'm... Um...
into any of your questions. And if you could just please introduce yourself and where you're coming from um, before addressing the panel. First, Carter. Well, I, I'm really, I have a question that's a little bit unfair. Um, I feel like it might be one that I should just have as a dialogue after. But um, uh, sorry, Carter Smith from Africa Wildlife, African Wildlife Foundation. Um, so I'm just, I so appreciate hearing these large scale models and discussing species, you know, not just in isolation and, um, but what I want to know is how this can be applicable to forest species. For instance, I worked with crowned eagles 20 years ago and we were breeding them and we were reintroducing them and we couldn't find space in the forest for the crowned eagles. If there was forest, there was already a pair of crowned eagles. So even back 25 years ago, it was, you know, we were trying to augment the species, but it was a different scenario where it was not because of poaching, it was because of land. It was strictly a land issue. And I know that I've heard some really good news stories from Rwanda with the gorillas. And that's what I highlight in my mind when I try and tackle this. But I'm just because my background is Kenya and I was with working with raptors and specifically with the raptor from the forest, I was left with that sort of negative, oh dear, what are we going to do? So I, as I say, it's a little bit of an unfair question because it's not the species we're talking about. But how is this sort of model applicable when we're talking about trying to grow land areas to reintroduce when breeding can be effective, um, as it was with the crown. Is that applicable to something? I think, I think in the first place, you know, we want to, we want to make sure that we do conservation the right way in the first place. Yeah. Because reintroductions are very expensive and they, they are plagued with so many problems. Um, but, uh, I think the, the incentive for for introducing uh, species has to be has to be there and it has to include multiple multiple stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, the I don't know the issue of, of raptors, but uh, in the rhino world, for example, uh, getting support from government for somebody who is going to introduce rhino is very very important yeah. because of the cost that comes with it. Not a private individual may not be able to do it even though they may be able to fence a sanctuary and be certified by, by the government to start that. So finding the right support for those individuals, because they, it's, it's like you're doing a social good, but you're, everything, if policy, policies don't support you, the, the, the weight and the cost of that is, on, is only on, on those individuals. But so I think my, my, my answer to that would be like, do it well in the first place, yeah. uh, because really reintroductions are, are, are very, very expensive. And sometimes it is the introduction of the species itself, but also rehabilitating habitat together with that. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that the potential lessons learned from the rhino world would be, and I think originally the rhino world didn't learn its lessons, was to look beyond the boundaries as well, to look beyond national boundaries, because I think, for oh, example, for sure. you know, the, with the northern white rhino, I think that potentially wasn't done, and they were lost. And I think, you know, looking at um, and with the raptors, I would assume that if, if there is still available habitat for crown eagles beyond Kenya and, and mm -hmm. some of the other areas, and had those boundaries not weren't considered, and there was more cooperation between neighboring countries than perhaps yeah, there's a better chance. A good... I mean, we've seen it now with. You know, riders coming in from different countries to support a, a, a small population in another country. And I think if you try and ignore those boundaries and try and get to a collective agreement. Yeah, making it more of a continental. I think to your point on habitat, I'm going to say something which is going to conflict, but our biggest issue in Africa is habitat loss. But at the same time, we have an enormous amount of protected area that is mm -hmm. currently non operational and not managed. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest challenges we face, I think, in the next five to ten years is how to operationalize those places because otherwise, as we've seen in Tanzania, they're going to start degazetting um, those areas. So in terms of space for expansion, it's there. 
With Rhino, the issue, of course, is the expense of moving and protecting once you get there. Lion, for example, there's opportunity for expanding and moving lions, but because of the human-wildlife conflict yeah. and the issues around management, people are saying, oh, we can't take it. But Tanzania is a great example where there is a lot of conservation area, I'm not saying national parks, mm -hmm. that is currently not being operationalized. And the president has been very clear, we will lose that if it's not actively managed. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, we have one in front and then Kate. Hi, I'm Maya with uh, Frankfurt Zoological Society. Um, kind of a complicated question, but I'm wondering if the communities, um, like how aware are the communities of the ecosystem services provided by rhinos? Um, and how does that, how, how do those crucial ecosystem services um, like provide, um, Sorry, <laughs> how do they, um, how does that play a role in their like conservation efforts, um, if that makes sense? Um, like education, um, I'm just wondering, because it seems that they're, they're so important um, for various reasons and including like ecotourism that could bring in money, um, so has, has there been an economic value assigned to these various ecosystem services that they provide? And would that be a helpful way of um, increasing conservation effort? Yeah, I mean, I can answer some of that, I'm sure, um, yeah, as well as well. I think, um, certainly in our context, the, the rhino is used as like a flagship species. So we, you know, we, the focus we're from talking about rhino, it can be elephant as well, um, it can be a number of species, but we use that basically to open the door to donors, we open the door with government on negotiations, we use it as leverage to protect a much wider area. So for example, we, the rhinos are in 1,200 square kilometers in the middle of North, North America National Park, and the money we raise on the back of those rhinos, or for, because of those rhinos, actually supports 22,000 square kilometers, so therefore supports a much wider ecosystem. Um, and, but you're right, I mean, I, 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 we don't really put a value on that at the moment, we need to because that's what it's getting down to, that's, what, that's what's key, that's what, you know, it's, 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 size of, it's, it's areas of that size that I think are going to make the difference with this climate change, with the loss of biodiversity, if we can protect them now. Um, for example, in North Luangwa, it has four of, the, the Luangwa Valley has, is a perennial river that flows into the Zambezi, it only has six perennial tributaries. Four of those rivers, the perennial tributaries, start in North Rwanda. So the more it's protected and the wider community area is protected, and whether that's with conservation farming or at least acceptable farming methods, as well as the use of the, the, the forest there, um, it's all linked back. And we're able to provide that support on the back of the rhino because people know that's what we do. We do rhinos, so it opens the doors for your say it could be EU, it could be whoever, to get money in. But we don't yet put a value on, I think, on that economic value. But I think it's coming. Maybe Kathleen might have more on this kind of things, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the simple answer is communities are extremely aware. They may not call it ecosystem services, but they're the ones that are experiencing a water shortage. Mm. They're experiencing soil degradation. Mm. And so they know it, they feel it every day. Um, and there is great progress in terms of quantifying the ecosystem services. I'd say there's less progress in getting people to pay. Um, Sabo is a great example where in Mulia, um, there are springs in Savo, which provide water to Mombasa, which is our second largest city in Kenya. Residents of Mombasa should be paying for that water. Um, we're starting to see that with some creative water ecosystem payment schemes. Um, Rwanda, what a surprise, is paving the way in terms of actually doing natural capital accounting. And I suspect they will be the first to actually incorporate that into their annual budget, which is exciting. So we're heading down that way. But, but I think it, just a, to be realistic, it's really a job that we haven't done well, we conservationists. We have not communicated the value of species yeah. to, you know, to your question. How many politicians think about rhinos as 
how, how many in Kenya, for example, associate the water that goes to Mombasa with rhino conservation in Savo? I would say very few. So whereas communities appreciate the presence of wildlife, it also comes with a cost, and that it is that cost that you hear more, more about. But it's, I think I'll just turn the ball to us and say, let's go and communicate conservation the way we, we, we understand it, because that's not what the, the politicians are, and the communities are looking at. They're looking at money, and they're they are looking at uh, livelihoods. But you know, not many people are associating ecosystem services. In Nairobi, for example, a lot of the water that goes to Nairobi, uh, the capital of Nairobi, comes from the Abadeas National Park, which has rhinos. I have never thought about that park with, with that water in the respect to rhinos. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think the job is ours, communicate much better uh, conservation. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So um, hi, Peyton West from Frankfurt Zoological Society. So Kathleen, for the for the impact bond, I'm wondering, is are rhino numbers the only metric? Because it seems like you could be losing something in that bigger picture if you're not looking at other Yeah, it's a great numbers. question, Peyton, and it is. Um, and we are aware, of course, that uh, one question people ask is, okay, and, and Philip alluded to this, that if you're just focusing on rhino, are you then going to have a negative impact on other species? So it's, it's a good point. And the other thing that we've considered carefully as well is this, the social um, metrics. So for example, I mentioned in the theory of change, there's a whole component on social inclusivity and benefits. The reason we decided on only one metric, again, is this is the first and we need to test the concept and that the more simple we can make this, the better. The great thing is that with all these um, protected area authorities, be it El Pejeta Conservancy or Sam Parks, they're looking holistically, of course, um, at their management scheme, but they do now have a very clear five-year strategy for rhinos, which will be incorporated into a larger scheme. Um, I'm Brady Newcomb from the Department of State. Uh, I have a question about, I want to bring it back to the movie. Um, in talking about this human-wildlife conflict, I have a question about the use of force. At the end of the film, we hear in Africa, well, a native Zulu speaker, you know what the rules of engagement are. And in South Africa, those are quite heavy. Um, I'm wondering what you all think the use of force should be. And if it should be as heavy as South Africa <laughs> uses it, or if it should be a little bit lighter. <laughs> Don't go rushing for that question on. This is my personal thing. I think uh, law enforcement uh, needs to take place, but uh, as I said, it needs to be socially acceptable. They, if, if you use force too much, it backfires. And the communities can, communities are like, just like in normal policing. Communities are a very, very important component of uh, successful conservation. If you, uh, if you go to a, a local area, the local leadership there knows, I mean, the communities know when there is a foreigner or somebody from not their communities. So you need to, you need to get them on your side. Uh, otherwise, you can't police everywhere. You, know, you can't police the whole 1,200. And that's only the rhino uh, you know, sanctuary. The whole of Luangwa is huge. And so I think the use of force to a large extent, backfires. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, as well. I think you have to be equipped for maximum use of force within your country within its framework, because I think the threat you're going to get is going to come in whatever form it needs to come, and to be able to be successful to commit the crime. So you do always have to be prepared to, to, to match that. How you then use it, how you then manage that, is going to be down to the your, your strategy and your the work with your communities. Um, I think you do, but unfortunately at the moment you need to be able to show the, the muscle, you need to be able to show that you have that, but ideally you don't have to use it. Another comment, what we've seen in Kenya, for example, is Kenya has been very successful, for example, in the Amboseli landscape. There are over 220 rangers that are Maasai from the landscape, and I think that's largely why we've seen a massive decrease 
in poaching. Um, I mean, we haven't lost elephants in that landscape in a long time. And there was great debate about arming the community members. And, and what I thought was positive was it, it was a dialogue with them about you know, their experience when they're in the field and they're going into a situation with poachers who are armed, um, how to best equip them so that they can do their job effectively. And what we're also seeing and, and what's been, for example, incorporated into the budget for the sites that I mentioned um, is training around, um, what's the right term, you know, human rights, training around sensitivity, but making all of those community members and rangers aware of, you know, how far can they go. And I think oftentimes without an AWF or a Frankfurt, some rangers aren't trained appropriately, and so they get into a situation where they actually don't know their rights. And so I think it's important to train them on that. But that dovetails into, into uh, fines as well. So it can be followed up. It could be there's force on the actual incident, but then there's force with fines. And sorry, I didn't mean to take from somewhere. Yeah, just, and, and, just and also, you, to, the, yeah. and, and, and I think uh, arresting somebody who's been arrested may be more valuable than somebody who's been shot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, follow yeah. enforcement. Yeah. question stems from Philip's um, PowerPoint. Um, you had a graphic on there. It was a bar graph of just like from 2009 to coaching efforts. And I just know it. I, I think it was pretty apparent. It was like from 2009 to 2014, there was an extensive increase. Um, I was just wondering what the factors were in that. I'm sure there are many, um, or if it was just a lack of information at the time, uh, but what that might be. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have had several, uh, a number of uh, poaching crises, you know, in the in the last say 50 years, and this is one of them from about 2007, and uh, we are currently in a poaching crisis. And uh, what that basically means is uh, the rate of increase through birds or survival is lower than the number of animals that are being killed uh, illegally. And for rhinos, we are just reaching a stage where we can, uh, we, uh, if not careful, all the gains since the 1990s will be reversed. Um, a number of factors, uh, an increasing uh, middle income uh, class in Vietnam, uh, demanding rhino horn and using all means of, of you know to, to acquire rhino uh, through either what is called pseudo hunting in South Africa where they will get a license and then hunt and take the you know, illegally export a rhino horn so ability to buy rhino horn the taste of that's why we do stop the demand education in Vietnam and in China Another one for Philip's PowerPoint. Uh, you put up, a, you, know, you said you were going to be provocative, and you put up a slide um, which clearly showed that there is going to be another bun fight at CITES uh, whenever the next uh, reschedule convention is going to be on on the appendix one, the appendix two status, both ivory and horn. And um, my reading of the statement that came out of the Kasani uh, meeting recently was very, there was over 600 words there, which could all be pretty much summarized in the final sentence, which is that, you know, we are very keen now to see some African elephants onto Appendix 2 and um, some kind of regulated trade. So I'm curious, um, perhaps speaking specifically to Rhino Horn, and we've seen John Hume and others in South Africa now pushing the domestic trade. Do you feel that there is any role for um, a regulated international or national trade in either rhino horn or ivory? <clears throat> Maybe your individual, not institutional. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my personal <laughs> <laughs> Just two more. Yeah. Let, 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 let me first declare that uh, I think uh, the rhino is very much endangered. And I, I feel that uh, at the moment, we are, the international community is concerned about uh, poaching and the message that you would be sending by introducing, uh, you know, introducing a, a commercial trade in, in rhino horn. 
Uh, so I would urge you know, countries that are making those proposals to give the rhino time to recover and to really get out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. You're losing more than 1,000 rhinos each year. They, and one might say, well, that's only happening. South Africa has got them, Namibia has got them, and uh, it doesn't matter what happens. The problem is whatever one country does during such a poaching crisis has impact on other countries. So at the moment, I would go with the status quo, uh, with the withholding any trade in, a, in, in Rhino Horn because of the impacts that it might have elsewhere in efforts that are being made, say, in Rwanda, in Kenya, and even in South Africa itself. But having said that, it is very, very important that those who are doing a good job not be left to it. The international community has got a big obligation to support those countries that are doing a good job so that they don't feel punished for doing a good job. For one more question. I have another question, but I don't want to dominate. So wait, there we go. I'm going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, on the moment, Rana, impact on. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah. And then there was yeah that, that slide. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand. Is so let's say we put in forty million dollars. Yep. And um, these guys, minor populations drop by 20% each. I still get my money back. So that's interesting because investors that we've gone to, they care less about the upside than they do the downside. Yeah. Not a surprise. Um, so essentially, this is what it looks like. Here's your 100%, this is your population size. So if you maintain it, you, you maintain, and we're still debating this, um, you essentially get all your money back. If you achieve the, the counterfactual, which is basically the growth rate right now, which is about 3.2% when you look at all five sites, then you get an increase. If you achieve the target at 5.6, which is above and beyond, then it's an increase. This is where most people, it's really interesting, um, are concerned. And, and the answer is yes, you will lose your money. The great thing, though, is that we are building on 60 years of data. And so we know what's a reasonable loss. And so we've defined, um, we've defined a loss kind of bracket that we're still trying to, to finalize. Um, and we do have an institution that's agreed to cover that first loss, which is great. Um, so we have an institution that's agreed to be the guarantor. So for example, going back to this slide, let's say your out compare is Philips company. And that, that company goes bust. Um, essentially, we have a, an institution that's agreed to, to guarantee that, which is wonderful. And we also have another institution that's agreed to cover that first loss. And again, we're building off of 60 years of data and also the selection of the five sites. Um, to lose within that bracket, I, I knock on wood, it would be really difficult to do. So we're making very calculated um, determinations in terms of where we think we can grow. And it was an interesting conversation at the field level because some some protected area authorities were like, well, let's just grow at 1.5% and then we know we're going to reach the targets. And then others <laughs> said, we can do 9%. We said, somewhere in the middle. Uh, but yes, it's, it's risky. And so again, as I started shifting the risk from traditional to Have you met your 40 million mark yet? No, no. we haven't. So we just um, we just got through the process of doing the investment ready. So for the last 12 months, it's been trialing different methodologies in the field, as well as um, doing these detailed budgets. We could not start the conversation until we knew we were talking 30 million, 35, or 40. So now that the last site was Savo, which was delayed because of what happened in Kenya, 
Um, now that we have the budgets, um, we're starting the conversation. Literally, we just started about a month ago. On the outcome payer side, investors, frankly, we have people lined up and ready to go. Their first question is, who's going to pay me back? Um, so we're starting with the outcome payers, and then we go to the investors. Yeah. I think I should mention that just for people's information, but uh, in Kenya, the moratorium on translocations was lifted last month, <coughs> so we can go back to managing rhinos the way in a, using biological management, which is component translocation is so important. So we're back. We have got a new uh, translocation protocol, and the, the rhino populations can grow. And I think this model is so dependent on on the ability to manage as, as meta populations. So. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that the webinar has been recorded and will be available online, um, as well as all the slide presentations. And I actually send those out to the registrants. So if you have registered, you'll get an email in two weeks. Um, there's plenty of coffee and the cookies in the back, so stick around if you like. And I just want to thank the panelists again for sharing your work and your experiences. And I know we've all benefited so much. Thank you.